Welcome back, deep divers. Ready for liftoff. Today, we're setting our sights on Apollo 11, but not the stuff everyone's heard a million times. Right, we're going deeper than the footsteps and the flags. We dug into a mountain of research articles, mission transcripts, you name it, all focused on the science of Apollo 11. Because it wasn't just about getting to the moon, it was about what we could learn once we were there. And let me tell you, 55 years later, those discoveries are still blowing our minds. Absolutely. This mission fundamentally changed our understanding of, well, everything. The moon itself, of course, but also Earth, the solar system, even the universe. Okay, so picture this. It's 1969. The world's holding its breath. Those astronauts are about to touch down. And remember, this is before we had rovers cruising around up there, beaming back selfies. Exactly. Nobody really knew what they were landing on. Was it going to be solid rock, a sea of dust, some kind of weird lunar quicksand? It was a huge E unknown. I mean, imagine the tension in mission control. One wrong calculation, one unforeseen hazard, and this audacious mission could become a tragedy. Talk about pressure. But they stuck the landing, thankfully, and what they found on that magnificent desolation, to borrow a phrase, was unlike anything anyone expected. It was this bizarre landscape, right? Covered in this incredibly fine, powdery dust called regolith, mixed in with rocks of all sizes. Billions of years of micrometeorites and solar wind basically pulverizing everything in sight. And as if landing on the moon wasn't tricky enough, this lunar dust turned out to be a real pain in the... well, everywhere. Oh, it was a nightmare. See, because it's constantly bombarded by charged particles from the sun, this dust is seriously electrostatic, like unbelievably staticky. I'm picturing the worst static cling ever, mm. but on a cosmic scale. That's it. It got everywhere, clogging up equipment, sticking to the astronaut suits, even finding its way inside the lunar module. Ugh. Talk about bringing your work home with you. Did they have any idea how to deal with this stuff? They learned some lessons the hard way, that's for sure. Yeah. But one tool that proved really valuable was the lunar dust detector. It sounds kind of basic, given everything else going on. Deceptively simple. But it gave us crucial data on how the dust behaved, how much of it there was, what it might mean for future missions. So already, Apollo 11 is highlighting that working on the moon is a whole different ballgame. You've got this abrasive, clingy dust everywhere, no atmosphere, intense radiation. Exactly. Apollo 11 was a wake-up call. It showed us just how hostile the lunar environment is and how vital it is to understand those challenges before we even think about sending humans back, let alone trying to build a permanent base. Okay, so we've talked about what it's like up there on the surface, but what about what's inside the moon? Reading these articles, I have to say, I was blown away by how much we learned about the moon's interior from Apollo 11. It's pretty incredible. I mean, before this mission, it was all speculation, right? We had theories, but no real way to confirm what was going on beneath the surface. Right. It's not like we could just go drilling for core samples back then. Exactly. So one of the key instruments they deployed was the seismometer. Now, those are the things that measure earthquakes, right? Yep, basically. But on the moon, we call them moonquakes. Moonquakes. Hadn't even considered that. Are those even a thing? Are they like the Earth ones? Well, not quite as dramatic as the Earth-shaking kind. They're usually caused by things like meteorite impacts or even the gravitational pull of the Earth itself. So the moon is constantly being stretched and squeezed. In a way, yeah. And those internal tremors, those moonquakes, they send vibrations throughout the moon's interior. And by studying those vibrations... We can start to build a picture of what's going on beneath the surface, kind of like taking an ultrasound of the moon. So what's the moon's internal anatomy like? Well, it's layered, just like Earth. You've got the crust, the mantle, and the core. Wow, so it really is like a mini Earth in there. Kind of, but there's some big differences too. One of the most significant findings was that the moon's core is proportionally much smaller than Earth's. Hmm, interesting. What does that tell us? It suggests that the moon went through a very different formation process compared to Earth. Which, again, is a whole other deep dive waiting to happen. But let's talk about age for a second. I mean, how did scientists use these moon rocks to figure out how old the moon actually is? Ah, uh, that's where the science of radiometric dating comes in. It's a mouthful, but basically... They look at the radioactive isotopes in the lunar samples and by measuring how much those isotopes have decayed over time. They can calculate how long ago those rocks formed. Exactly. It's like having a cosmic clock embedded in the rocks themselves. And what they found was the moon is old, like really old, about 4.5 billion years old, roughly the same age as the solar system itself. Wow, we're talking about some seriously ancient history here. But OK, so we know the moon is old. But how does knowing that help us understand anything beyond the moon itself? 
That's where the craters come in. See, now that we have a firm date for the moon's formation, and we know that those craters were created by impacts over billions of years. We can start to piece together a timeline of when those impacts occurred. Precisely. It's like looking at the moon's face and seeing a record of every single asteroid or comet that's hit it since the beginning of the solar system. So the moon is like a giant cosmic dartboard preserving evidence of all these ancient collisions? And not just for the moon, either. By understanding the timing and frequency of those impacts, we can learn a lot about the bombardment history of the entire inner solar system. Okay, so how does that work? Well, if a particularly large object slammed into the moon billions of years ago, it's very likely that Earth and the other inner planets were also getting pummeled around the same time. So by studying the moon's craters, we're not just learning about its history, but also the history of our own planet. Exactly. And it tells us that the early solar system was a much more chaotic and violent place than it is today, with asteroids and comets whizzing around like bumper cars. It's kind of amazing to think about. We look to the moon to understand other worlds, but it's also giving us this incredible window into our own planet's past, a past that's been erased here on Earth by things like erosion and plate tectonics. The moon is a time capsule, a silent witness to events that shaped our entire solar system. And it all started with a few brave astronauts, a whole lot of ingenuity, and a few seismometers listening to the whispers of the moon's ancient heart. You know, it's wild to think that everything we're learning about the moon isn't just about some far-off rock in space, but it's directly connected to us here on Earth. Oh, absolutely. It's like the moon is holding up a mirror to our own planet's history, reflecting events that happened billions of years ago. And one of the biggest surprises to come out of the Apollo missions, at least for me reading about it, was the discovery of water on the moon. Right. It's not exactly what you picture when you think of the lunar surface. I always imagined it as this completely dry, airless, you know, desolate wasteland. That was the assumption for a long time. But when scientists analyzed those lunar samples, they found something pretty amazing. Traces of water molecules trapped inside some of the minerals. Wait, seriously, so there's actually H2O on the moon? Not liquid water, not oceans or rivers or anything like that. More like tiny amounts of water, chemically bound within the rocks themselves. Okay, but still, water is water. Where did it come from? Was it always there or did it arrive later? That's a question scientists are still trying to nail down. But the leading theory is that this water was delivered to the moon over billions of years by comets and asteroids. <laughs> Basically, imagine a constant barrage of icy particles crashing into the lunar surface. So the moon has been collecting these little bits of water for eons. But if there's no atmosphere to speak of, why doesn't it just evaporate away? That's the thing. With almost no atmosphere to speak of, the water doesn't have anywhere to go. It gets trapped in the shadows, frozen in the lunar soil, preserved for billions of years. That's incredible. OK, so we've got this ancient water on the moon, this shared history of bombardment. Are there any other major links between the moon and Earth that these missions helped us understand? Absolutely. Remember when we talked about the composition of those moon rocks? How similar they are to Earth rocks? Yeah, and how different they are from Martian rocks or meteorites. Exactly. And that similarity in composition, especially in their oxygen isotopes, lends a lot of support to one of the most fascinating theories about the moon's formation, the giant impact hypothesis. The idea that the moon was created from a chunk of Earth that got blasted off during a collision. That's the one. The theory goes that early in the solar system's history, this Mars-sized object slammed into Earth. Yeah. And the debris from that collision, instead of just flying off into space, yeah. gradually coalesced, came together, and formed the moon. So when we look up at the moon, we're not just seeing our celestial neighbor. We're seeing a piece of Earth itself flung off into space billions of years ago. It's mind-blowing, isn't it? This idea that the moon and Earth are so intimately connected born from the same cosmic event. It really makes you appreciate how interconnected everything is in our solar system in the universe. But speaking of looking at the moon, one of the coolest things I came across in my research for this deep dive was this thing called the laser ranging retro reflector. It does sound like something straight out of Star Wars, doesn't it? Right, but it's actually real. And it's been up there on the moon since Apollo 11. It's a remarkably simple concept, really. Essentially, it's a special mirror designed to reflect laser beams fired from Earth back to their source. So we're talking about shooting lasers at the moon and timing how long it takes for them to bounce back. Exactly. <clears throat> and by measuring that round-trip travel time with incredible precision, scientists can determine the distance between Earth and the moon down to the centimeter. That's insane. 
But why go through all that trouble to measure the distance so precisely? What can that tell us? Well, for one thing, it's revealed that the moon is slowly drifting away from us at a rate of about 1.5 inches per year. Wait, the moon is moving away? Is that... is that bad? Should we be worried? No need to panic. It's a very slow process, nothing catastrophic. It's yeah. just a natural consequence of the gravitational dance between the Earth and the moon. Okay, that's a relief. But still, it makes you wonder, right? What are the long-term effects of this lunar drift? What happens if the moon keeps moving further and further away? That's a question that keeps scientists up at night, believe me. The Earth-Moon system is a delicate balancing act, and even small changes can have big effects over vast stretches of time. But that's the beauty of science, isn't it? It's a never-ending quest for understanding, and the more we learn, the more we realize how much we still don't know. We've covered a lot of ground today, from moonquakes to moon dust to the mind-blowing realization that the moon might be a piece of Earth itself. It makes you appreciate the legacy of those Apollo missions, how those first steps on the lunar surface opened up a universe of possibilities. It was a pivotal moment in human history, no doubt. And those missions, those discoveries, they continue to inspire us today to push the boundaries of knowledge, to explore the cosmos, to unravel the mysteries of the universe we live in. So next time you look up at the night sky and you see that familiar face staring back at you, remember? It's not just a celestial object, it's a time capsule, a treasure trove of scientific discovery. And who knows what secrets are still waiting to be unearthed, waiting for someone, maybe even one of our listeners, to take that next giant leap. Keep looking up, deep divers.